Okay, thanks. Uh, in August this year, the Queensland Industrial Relations Commission handed down its decision in relation to the Queensland Police Service Certified Agreement, known as EV6. Uh, the cost of additional police wages awarded by the decision is approximately $272 million over the three-year life of the agreement and approximately $130 million per annum thereafter. Uh, while the Queensland Government will fund the majority of this cost, the Queensland Police Service is required to fund approximately $27 million annually towards the cost of the agreement. Uh, $25 million of that um, is to be found, uh, sorry, $25 million of that is the gap between the Government commitment of 2.5 per cent and the actual uh, award uh, that was granted which was 3.8% for the first year, 38 for the second year and 3.5% for the third year. But our total cost is $27 million annually uh, towards it. Um, now, in accordance with government policy, there will be no reduction in operational police numbers uh, or future planned police growth. Uh, that's the commitment to us. Uh, and, but to obtain the police contribution to the savings that will be required, will primarily be achieved by reducing the number of civilian positions in the Queensland Police Service. Uh, yesterday I met with all members of the Senior Executive of the Police Department to discuss uh, how we would achieve this. Uh, we've had to make some difficult decisions, however we're committed to ensuring that the changes that are made with the reduction in civilian staff numbers have as little impact on frontline service delivery to the community as is possible. Uh, another key point with this is that no permanent QPS employee, civilian staff member, will be forced to leave their employment as a result of this process. Uh, the reductions uh, to achieve the savings in terms of our contribution will be achieved in a number of ways. Uh, firstly, we had planned to have some growth this financial year and we're going to withdraw uh, all of those growth positions. They haven't actually been put into place yet. Uh, but the funding from that will be diverted to the savings. There was 25 civilian growth positions uh, and 55 civilianisation positions. That means what we call one for one. Uh, we would have a police officer doing a job uh, that we could have uh, replaced that police officer with a civilian. Um, we are also, and this is the primary way we're going to achieve these savings, is through extending uh, the VSP or voluntary separation program offers to all of our uh, civilian staff members in the organisation. Um, we need to achieve about 250 positions by doing that. Uh, we've got about 50 now, uh, so we have about 200 to go. If uh, we're un unable to achieve the targets that we uh, have set ourselves in that regard, uh, we'll achieve it through natural attrition. Uh, we have over 4,000 civilian staff members and our attrition rate runs at about 8 to 10 per cent a year people who leave the organisation through, as they do with any organisation. So uh, I'm confident that we will achieve these savings uh, through these, this means. Now, uh, we acknowledge, though, that this process may involve restructuring in some areas uh, or involve changing some work practices. Uh, so in accordance with that, we've set up two committees. The first will examine the voluntary separation program applications and any associated restructuring with that. And the second has a longer term role, it's to examine and manage business process change in terms of savings that we can make generally. Uh, we recognise absolutely that our responsibility is to provide the best possible policing service we can to the people of Queensland within the resources available to us and we are absolutely committed to doing that. Uh, thank you for listening to me in relation to that and I'm happy to take any questions you have. The union uh, bashing the government over the head uh, saying that um, the loss of civilian staff will force more of their members behind counters and desks. They're also very critical of the special operation you set up on the coast, saying that four civilians are going from that, and that means four less police as part of that operation down there. OK. Um, we will uh, endeavour to um, minimise any impact on operational police. Uh, and obviously we intend to minimise also any impact on our service delivery to the community. Um, as this unfolds, obviously, we'll get a me better be measure and gauge of that. I can't guarantee that there won't be some impact. What I'm saying, though, is we intend to absolutely try and minimise that. As part of that, uh, whilst the, um, uh, the 
losses, I suppose, in civilian staff numbers need to be spread across the entirety of the service. What we're doing is taking by far the biggest hit here in headquarters. Uh, Percentage-wise, it equates to about a 7% reduction in our civilian staff numbers. What we are going to do is, is uh, for the regions and our two operational commands, um, that will be reduced to around about 4 to 5%, and for headquarters, it'll be around 10 to 12%. So headquarters is going to take a significantly larger loss in terms of staffing, civilian staffing numbers than the operational regions as well. Um, throughout the entirety of this process, we'll gauge the impact uh, of the, the loss of the civilian staff members in terms of any operational policing impact and manage that to the best of our ability. Can I just come back to the other one? I'm just not quite sure what the Union B might mean by that. I'm sorry? Resolve, sorry, operational resolve. Yeah, yeah, look, um, that, uh, that unit uh, is primarily detectives and recently we added two to it to take it from 18 to 20. Uh, and those two positions were intelligence officers. Now, they could be police or they could be civilians. Uh, we have police officers who do that work and civilians. I'm not even sure that those extra two positions have been filled, and it's far too early to make that call with the greatest respect of the union. Um, it's far too early to make that call as yet. Uh, the, the, the VSP offer is only going out tomorrow. We're just finalising it now, so uh, nothing's been done yet. Would communication centres um, that take triple zero calls be one of the areas that could potentially be affected either through the voluntary redundancies or through the non-employment of expanded positions that were intended to go in? No, not in the long term at all. Um, there are some positions uh, that are absolutely fundamental and if we took the person away from the position um, we would have to replace them with a police officer and they are two good examples that you gave. Um, uh, uh, radio communication rooms are one where our civilian staff members either take calls from the public or do that as well as um, call police vehicles and direct them to jobs. Another area is um, our civilian watch house officers. Now if we took either of those people out of watch houses or communication rooms we would have to replace them uh, with a police officer uh, and there's no intention to do that. Now it may well be that we have someone who wants to take a VSP in a radio room and we might allow them to go, but we will replace them if that does happen. But it's unlikely that we could spare people from those areas because they are such critical roles. So just to be clear, radio rooms and, and watch houses, mm. there will be no replacement of civilians with uniformed officers. Uh, that's correct. Um, and as well, there will be no reduction in the numbers in those areas. We might let a civilian in those areas take a VSP, although that would be unlikely. Um, but if we did, we would replace that person. What about planning increases over the next year? Yeah, uh, for civilian staff members, um, I just can't give you an answer on that at the moment. We've basically, as I said, um, stopped that program for this year. We've withdrawn the plans that we had, and we've had to do that. Uh, and to some extent that's less painful because you don't miss what you haven't had. Um, so uh, future growth uh, we'll have to look at. The government have committed though, um, uh, which I am grateful for, uh, and I'm not politically aligned, but I think you need to acknowledge that, um, well I do, uh, that um, last year we had 150 extra police and this year uh, my understanding is there will be a further 150 extra police. If you lose 10% of your civilian workforce in here, Will that mean you've got to bring uniformed officers back in from other locations to, to do some of those roles, or will existing headquarters staff be sufficient to cover that, that loss? Yeah, I would hope that we'd be able to restructure, um, remodel workloads. Um, we would, uh, that would be an absolute last resort, um, an absolute last resort to take a police officer from an operational role uh, and put the officer into a non-operational role. Um, I would like to avoid that at all costs. Uh, we do have a number of police currently in non-operational roles, and it may be possible, you know, to do some restructuring in that space as well. Um, but um, well, I that assurance commission. Is that your intention, statewide, or just oh, no, absolutely, it is. Yeah, as as I've said, and look, I can't stress enough uh, that we recognise what our primary responsibility is, and that's to provide for the safety and security of the community, uh, and to deliver, you know, a service to the community. And that's number one, will always be the number one priority. Uh, and um, everything we do in terms of meeting these savings targets will be focused uh, on minimising 
um, any impact operationally. How challenging is this going to be for you to ensure that there is no frontline impact from losing 330 odd positions? Oh, look, it, it's not going to be easy, obviously, um, to, to manage this, and it's going to take several months. Uh, we think that the final VSP offer uh, will be concluded on the 2nd of March, so we're looking at probably a four or five month process here. Uh, and um, as I said, the, the, the guarantee and undertaking I give is that we will minimise, minimise the impact on operational policing. I can't give you an undertaking that there will be no impact on operational policing. That would be quite wrong for me to do that. But what I do say to you is that we will minimise the impact as much as we possibly can. Are you in saying that staff numbers are already at crisis point and this is going to put lives at risk? What's your response to that? I don't think we're at crisis point and um, as I said we are going to minimise the impact on operational policing and on that point um, within operational policing and providing the service that we do to the public in terms of their safety and security uh, within all of those important things that we do number one number one of all of it is everything and anything to do with public safety uh, that's always been our number one priority and it will continue to be so uh, our second priority is property crime. So in other words, our number one priority is the, safe, the physical safety of people and the most serious offence always in that space has been homicide, uh, violent assault, armed robberies, anything that's related to people's safety. And our second priority is property crime. Uh, and I think that, that's what most people would expect. And within property crime there are things like theft, break and enters, car theft, those sorts of things. Uh, so they're our priorities and that will remain unchanged. Sure, if I could ask you about another matter as well. Yesterday at the Gold Coast at Narang, a 13-year-old boy was subdued with a capsicum spray. What are your thoughts on, on that incident yesterday? Yeah, look, I've read the brief on that, um, I'm, in, and I'm not prejudging it, um, uh, you know, but in my view, the officers acted appropriately. In my view, it was uh, a really unusual and, and difficult set of circumstances. Uh, and I think that their actions um, are not only appropriate, I actually intend to ring them and thank them for the work they did. It's really regrettable that we have to capsicum spray a 13 year old, but this was a most unusual set of circumstances and one that I think um, we would all uh, not want to see happen again. Is it standard practice to use capsicum spray on minors? No, not at all. In fact, it's to be avoided uh, and it's rare that it happens. Um, and if it does happen, it needs to be examined, and it will be. Um, and and um, we need to be sure that the use was appropriate. And that's what I meant when I said I'm not prejudging what they did. But, but on my reading of it, um, uh, they acted appropriately. Uh, and quite frankly, on my reading of it, um, they should be congratulated for the way they handled what could have been a very difficult situation. Uh, and that was my intention. I haven't had time yet to ring them and thank them for what they did. That, that we acknowledge up front uh, that capsicum spraying a 13-year-old is not something we do as standard practice and it should only ever occur in rare and unusual circumstances, but quite frankly they did exist yesterday. That 13-year-old uh, has ended up now in the Watch House and will be there I think until Monday. The mm -hmm. parents of the lad are very upset about that. Is that appropriate treatment following uh, his uh, apprehension, do you think? Decisions like that are not made by the police, uh, only in the very short term initially in terms of custody. And with juveniles, um, there's always an overview as well of that decision. Um, so really that's a matter for the court. And um, I, uh, I, I, as you know, I've never entered into comment in that space. Just, just on the issue of the um, intelligence officers would resolve, if they were civilian positions, would, would the terms of what's happening now mean that they would not then be filled? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that last bit. If, they, if, if, if they are civilian positions, the, the, the two extra intelligence officers you're talking about, would these new arrangements mean that they would not then be filled? Uh, can I come back to you on that? And I'm not trying to avoid your question, but it is just a little bit too hypothetical. Um, I am happy to say this, though, that we've just established resolve. The assistant commissioner down there convinced me that apart from the 18 detectives that we needed two intelligence officers, it would be a pretty retrograde spit to only a couple of months ago having agreed to that to then reduce that number. 
And from what I, for certainly from my perspective, um, Task Force Resolve, that unit, uh, which is, I think, almost complete in the process of now having the temporary positions converted to permanent positions, is doing some really good work. And today, the nature of detective work and investigative work is it does need a solid intelligence-based support, you know, to make it as effective as is possible. So I can't give you a definitive answer, but I think it's highly unlikely that we would be reducing the numbers in, in the resolve group. Are there certain regions in Queensland that will be affected more than others? No, really good question. Um, thanks for asking it. Um, it's our intention to even this out. Um, so even if in one region uh, a large number of people applied for a voluntary separation package and in fact received that package and in another region hardly anyone applied for it and received it, we will even and balance that out through um, attrition and, and adjustment over time uh, so that everyone will take the same share of the reduction and as I said our plan at this stage is that the eight regions and the two operational commands which are Operation Support Command uh, which consists of that multitude of things like the Water Police and the Dog Squad and the Special Emergency Response Team and the Public Safety Response Team and the other group, State Crime Operations Command, which is our specialist investigative detective groups like the Armed Robbery Squad and the Homicide Squad, uh, that they and the eight regions will take a cut of around 4 to 5 per cent and headquarters will take a cut of around 10 to 12 per cent to balance it out and to minimise the impact on those operational areas. But we all have to share in this across the state. I can't do this without having everyone take us some share of it. It's spread over two years, Commissioner, isn't it? The no. Cuts? No, we'll be looking at achieving... The no, we'll be, um, well, we'll be looking at achieving um, the $25 million saving um, this year and every year thereafter. after. Um, it may well be that we're just not able to achieve it this year and there has to be some rollover into next year, that's quite right, uh, because we're well and truly advanced into this financial year now. And the final take up on our current timing of a VSP package is the 2nd of March. Well, as at the 2nd of March, I mean, we're what, nearly, I think, um, eight or nine months into the financial year. Uh, but I'm sure that, um, you know, Treasury will cooperate with us in that. And, and that's not unusual that in large organisations with significant budgets, there can be some carryover and some adjustment over two financial years. Where do you envisage um, 10 to 12% of the civilian positions to come from? Are there any areas, say in HQ, where there's a glut for civilians? I wouldn't describe it as a glut um, by any means. Um, but there are some areas that, that have larger numbers of civilian staff members than others. Uh, one area is our information communications technology area. Uh, so clearly when you're working on a percentage basis, uh, the larger the area in terms of the number of civilian staff members, then that w the larger their contribution will be. Um, and, but um, it will be even, it'll be fair, and a really important point, if I could just make it again, is that no civilian staff member will be forced out of the organisation, okay? Everyone who leaves um, will either take a voluntary separation package, uh, which is a very generous package, um, or alternatively, uh, through attrition, that is just through the natural course of people who leave us and seek other employment, um, we will find the necessary positions, but no one will be forced out. Information communications that um, people who work on the CAD system say and update the news to the media team? Well, well, I can't tell you at the moment precisely um, from what units uh, people will leave, and we recognise the need to maintain, I mean, service delivery, operational frontline policing, that's critical, that's fundamental, and as I've said, we will absolutely endeavour to minimise any impact there at all. Um, but uh, operational police need the people uh, behind the scenes uh, to function and operate as well. Every large organisation needs a payroll system uh, and a finance division. Every large organisation needs a HR system to manage leave and transfers. Uh, every large organisation today needs an, an IT system, you know, to back them up. Uh, Information is the lifeblood of police. So we'll need to ensure that as we work through this uh, that we do it fairly, balanced, even. Um, and that the restructuring and, and adjustments that are needed um, as well, um, that the cuts aren't too deep in any particular area. Okay. Just on a different matter, uh, tomorrow is the date for Daniel Morecambe. They're expecting about a million people. Um, is there any chance that that will be delayed? Or is it just a matter of time? 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 Or is it just a
this is going to be one of the legacies that Daniel will leave, this promotion of safety within the community? Look, I do, um, and I think um, it's um, uh, a great tribute to Bruce and Denise Morecambe that from uh, the tragedy of the circumstances that surround um, uh, Daniel's d disappearance and, and death, uh, that they have uh, turned that into the Daniel Morecambe Foundation uh, and that they, well now together with the state government, uh, that they, um, you know, um, progress this message of child safety throughout the state. Um, and as you're probably well aware, there are two major days each year are tomorrow, the, uh, the day for Daniel, which is the walk for Daniel, and then in March every year they have the dance for Daniel, which is um, uh, a major, the major fundraiser that they have every year on the Sunshine Coast. Um, and um, I'll be there tomorrow. Um, uh, I know a number, well, I think thousands of people will be. I think it'll probably be the, the largest uh, day for Daniel and walk for Daniel that's ever been held, and that's understandable in the recent circumstances as well. But, but indeed, um, yeah, I, I think that uh, the way Bruce and Denise have, have turned this into the work they do through the Daniel Morecambe Foundation, uh, and, and it's not just about, uh, they do work beyond, um, uh, you know, getting child safety um, messages out there. Um, behind the scenes, they've actually provided support and assistance to child victims as well. Um, so, yeah, very commendable. Okay, anything else at all? Okay, thanks for your time and happy to come back on this one at any future time as well. Thank you.